Revelation of the Bible Prophecy. And the principle we're going to use, of course, is one that we commonly use from Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17. It's the overarching principle when you come to deal with all prophecy. But this matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the watchers here, of course, are the angels, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruler from the kingdom of men. Well, of course, the dead don't have a great deal of interest in what's going on in the kingdom of men. So prophecy is designed for those who are living that we might see the hand of God at work. And in fact, prophecy is the mould into which history is poured because God sends forth his angels to ensure that what he spoke through the prophets actually comes to pass. And so we are confident that what we're seeing going on in the world around us is in fact the work of our God through his angels. And of course he does give it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basis of men. Now, according to the way you interpret that phrase, the basis of men, something that's a reference to Jesus Christ, who was the lowest of men, but I prefer to think that it has to do with men like Vladimir Putin, uh, the basis of men upon the face of the earth, and also the richest men on earth, uh, apparently worth something in the $70 billion mark. So, we won't be talking tonight about Putin, we'll be talking about America, his opponent in the scheme of things. Now, watchmen had a duty in Israel of old. In Isaiah 21 verse 12, the watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, you return, come. And of course, there are some very dark things coming before the dawn of the kingdom of God arrives. There is going to be a very bright future, of course, as we know for our world, but a very dark night will precede it. But we need to be ready, we need to know where we sit in the scheme of things, and we know that we are very near the end. All the signs are converging, the world is teetering on the edge of a <coughs> precipice. All that's required is angelic manipulation to trigger that crisis. Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, tell us that that's a very vital time. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now we know that that book is the book of life. Because it goes on to say in the next verse, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But you notice the phrase, and at that time, which is also repeated down here, and at that time, we're being told something very important here. And that is that the resurrection is the beginning of the time of trouble such as never was. So when Christ returns to raise the dead and to send forth his angels to perform that work and then collects the responsible living together with them that they might go to the place of judgment, that is the time when the time of trouble, such as never was, strikes this world. It's concomitant with the event of the resurrection. And that's extremely important because there's no question the world is actually teetering on the edge of one of the greatest catastrophes to ever hit it. And even the world knows that. They know that the coming depression is going to be so deep that one commentator, who's actually an optimist by the way, man by the name of Richard Duncan, says that he doesn't believe that modern civilization will survive the depression that is coming. And he's doing all his power to avoid it because he knows that the civilization is not going to survive. All right, so it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Now you have people like Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, who warned in December 2011, which is now all a way away. She said this. She's the head of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. If the international community doesn't work together, the risk from an economic point of view is that of retraction, rising protectionism and isolation. This is exactly the description of what happened in the 1930s and what followed, which of course was World War II, is not something we are looking forward to. Now, when you're in charge of an organisation like the International Monetary Fund, you don't go around making statements like that unless you know that it's true. Because you can spook the markets, you can make you know, all, all sorts of problems for banks and, and countries. Well, she knows what's coming. 
as many people do know what's coming. So what might trigger this collapse that is coming, which is really overdue in many ways, it's only waiting for God to give the signal. Well, it could be the collapse of the US dollar against other currencies, due to soaring debt in that country, the, the third or fourth round of quantitative easing or printing money, simply means adding zeros to the bank balance, and the political gridlock that there is in America, of course, as you're fully aware, being your next door neighbor. It could be OPEC and other cartels abandoning the US dollar as the international currency for trade and oil other commodities. If they did that, it would bankrupt America immediately. Because all of those dollars that are out there that are being used by nations around the world for trading would have to come back to where they came from. And the US Treasury doesn't have the kind of funding uh, to repatriate that debt. The departure of Greece will similarly bankrupt southern European states from the Eurozone could bring down the European Central Bank, which has debts of $450 billion owing to it. $450 Euro owing to it. Or it could be serious natural disasters that disrupt world trade and the supply of food. Because you see, in California, which is the fourth largest economy in the world, it's huge, produces a good proportion of the food that is consumed by the 350 Ameri 50 million Americans who live in that country. And I guess you also consume food that comes from California here in Canada. So what's happening down there? Well, they're in the third year of drought in California. And they got this much snow in January 2013, and it was not enough to even begin to make a mark on their dams and reservoirs that are extremely low. Well, they had some expectation of a better winter. January the 13th, 2014, that was the amount of snow on the Rocky Mountains. It's a fraction of what was there in 2013. And what was there in 2013 was a fraction of what it used to be, and that's why you can go, and I've been past a few of these, you can go to California today and drive past their dams. This is one in San Jose. It has nothing in it. I drove past one where normally you see a lot of boats more. Okay? But they were all, well, there were no boats there because they'd taken the, the, the wharf, which normally had a hundred foot of water beneath it, was sitting on the mud. All right? California is in serious trouble. They've had a little bit of rain, but not anything like they need to even begin to break that down, drought. So you know what farmers are doing? Farmers are actually not planting. Farmers are not pruning their trees because there's not going to be any water. They're not going to waste money. So California could be one of the triggers. But if it's not that, it will be the huge accumulating debt in America which is going to undermine their dollar. Now this gentleman here is John Carroll Williams, He's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, so he's no bunny. He serves on the Federal Open Market Committee, and he puts out this document, Shadow Government Statistics every now and then, to tell the state of the game. And this is his latest one, January the 7th, 2014. And in that, he makes some extraordinary remarks. His opening comments are well worth reading, but I'm not going to read them, I'm just going to summarise what he says in this 50-odd page document. He gives a whole series of charts and, you know, reasons why he makes this statement. See this heading here, hyperinflation 2014, the end game begins? Well, he says there's a 90% chance that there will be a hyperinflationary Great Depression beginning in 2014. Now, hyperinflation is the kind of inflation that Zimbabwe had when they printed money for two years. Their inflation rate went from, you know, in the single digits, like most countries that we are familiar with are, to 34,000% per annum. 34,000% per annum. And in the end they had trillion dollar, whatever the note was, they had trillion dollar notes. <clears throat> and you only buy a pack of chewing gum. Alright, so that's what happens. Now that is what this gentleman is saying is about to happen in America. Whether he's right, whether it's 2014 or 2015, all the conditions are there for that kind of thing to happen. They've created them. They've created a monster, and the monster is about to turn on and to devour them. 
Now, why is this important to us? Well, it's important to us because in Luke 17, just a chapter or two back from what we read, Luke 17, we have the Lord Jesus Christ telling us what it was going to be like when he returned to the earth. Now, there are people saying, well, you know, we could go into very hard times and uh, we could end up being, you know, standing in, in uh, queues and soup kitchens and, and having to receive government handouts. I mean, there are 35 million people in America currently on food stamps, which has cost, cost them an enormous amount of money. You know, but we've got to read our Bibles carefully. The Lord Jesus Christ couldn't have been clearer. It could not have been clearer that we will be taken, those of us who are responsible, will be taken to the judgment seat of Christ from times of prosperity. And that's his message, his clear message in Luke 17. It's the same message in Luke 21. And you get the same message in Revelation chapter 3. So he couldn't have been clearer about this. We will not be taken from times of poverty and misery and cutopia. We will be taken maybe from the queue where you get into a restaurant. That's what he's selling us. Because he says in Luke chapter 17, verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So what were they doing in the days of Noah? Well, they were eating and drinking. He's not talking about eating an evening meal at your home table. He's talking about restaurant, restaurant type eating and pub type drinking. They were married and being given in marriage. It was a culture of pleasure and enjoyment, you know, jump into one relationship and out of that into another one, into another one and out of that. That kind of thing going on. The wedding industry, of course, the marriage business today is huge. People spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to get married and do it several times. But we buy it and sell it, preoccupation and acquisition. They're never satisfied. There's always got to be something they're going to buy. That's the that's the, the world in which we live. And planting and building, of course, had to do with gain and luxury. That's the character of the times that Christ said he would come in. That was the character of the days of Noah. It was the character of the days of Lot. Now, why does he choose those two years? Think about it for a while. Well, because they had a common denominator. Now, if I was to ask you, what was the character of the days of Noah, you would reply to me, well, the earth was filled with immorality and violence. True? You won't find one word about that in what Christ says. Not a single word. If I was to ask you what the problem in the days of, of Lot was in Sodom, you would say, gross immorality of the kind that's filling this world today. He doesn't say a word about it. So why not? Is he suggesting that those things wouldn't happen? No. We see immorality, we see violence. We see the kind of thing that was going on in Sodom. He's not interested in that. He's, he's saying to us that the great danger for his people, the warning he wants to give his people, is materialism. It's prosperity. And he's telling us that we are going to be taken, like Noah and like Lot and his family, from the times of prosperity. That's what he's saying. Well, anybody. But half an eye open can see that the prosperity that we've been used to for the last 70 years is about to disappear for good. Anybody can see that coming. So you see there's a message in that, isn't there? I don't, I don't know. I don't know when it's going to come, whether it's this year or next year or the year. I don't know. But I know that it's coming, and so does the world. Alright? So we're that close. We're that close to the, the removal, to the place of judgment. So the Lord Jesus Christ is is giving us a message because you see all prosperity in the days of Noah and the days of Lot disappeared in a day. In a day. So when Lot was taken out those people of Sodom who went down to the local coffee shop to get their latte in the morning didn't arrive. They were blown off the face of the earth because Lot was far enough away. It will be exactly the same for you and me, and that's why they won't be interested in what's happened to us. They won't be interested as to why you haven't turned up to buy this hall anymore. Because most people that, you're, that are your neighbours today will be lining up at their banks the morning after we have been taken to the judgment seat. And most of them will lose their jobs within a very short time. And there'll be many houses in Camloops empty. Yours won't be the only one. They're not going to wonder about it. They might wonder why there's a motor vehicle sitting in the driveway because that means, look, you've gone on Chance's Pony wherever you've gone, but 
they're not going to be concerned about it because they will be up to their ears in their own problems. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon the earth. And guess who's leading the world into that? The USA. The USA. So when we talk about USA in the news and in Bible prophecy, they play a very prominent part. I'm going to take you to Luke 21 later on and I'll show you what it says. In inference about the USA. Well, depressions happen like this. <clears throat> in October 1929, there was a stock market crash and people were jumping out of buildings in New York because they'd lost all their money. <coughs> Someone sold a Model T Ford for a dollar. That's all the work. By 1930, there was a depression, a worldwide depression. It took them 10 years to dig out of it and only then with a war. The war is what brought the world out of depression. So, the, the collapse that the world knows is coming is actually, it's overdue. It's really overdue. When it comes, same pattern will be followed. There will be a time of trouble such as there was, and the only way that the world's going to get out of that is by a war, which we believe will be Armageddon. All right? So, that's the pattern, and it's not all that far away. So, what will this huge crash trip? Well, international bankruptcy will cause rap radical and rapid change on our world. Middle East peace, which is a requirement before Armageddon, will be achieved at last. Most nations will have to abandon their foreign adventures. Won't be able to afford to have troops somewhere else. In fact, they won't even be able to afford to have, have a reasonable army anymore. And that's going to allow nations like Russia, who have their part to play in Bible prophecy, to expand their territories. It will see a complete realignment in Europe, out of which 10 nations will emerge on the territory of the old Roman Empire. That's the southern European nations, south of the Rhine and the Danube, just like it was in the ancient time. So the old Roman Empire will be revived, like we know in Daniel 7, verse 7, it has to be. It'll be there, it'll be destroyed by Christ. And Israel will remain prosperous on the back of huge fines of oil and gas that have made them independent from America and other nations. You know, we're also told in prophecy that all of Israel's former allies will depart from them. Jeremiah 30, verses 12 to 14. For thus said Yahweh, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy mothers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wounded enemy, etc. So there's a prophecy there that prior to the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the subject matter of Jeremiah 30, and that's Armageddon, prior to Armageddon, Israel is going to lose all of its former friends. Now, we know, of course, what's happening in relation to America's attitude to Israel. America's attitude has changed substantially. So this prophecy in Jeremiah 30, verses 13 to 14, requires Israel to be forsaken by friends before Armageddon. And here's a bit of a taste of what they had in the past. Because they're going to get this in the future. Of the 175 United Nations Security Council resolutions and the 690 General Assembly resolutions passed before 1990, 97 of the 175 and 429 of the 690 were directed against Israel. Not a bad record, is it? And this is all before 99. So you get a bit of a feel for how the nations general regard Israel. But America stood by them. So they could thumb their nose at their enemies. America is no longer standing behind Israel like they used to. So both the US and Britain have shifted their attitude towards Israel recently, and so has the country I come from, Australia. About the only country that's held fast is Canada. India too, but Canada. We want to talk a bit about what that means for this country. The once close ally of Israel, Turkey, led action to boycott Israel over the, uh, over the Gaza fiasco of 2010. And so Turkey is no longer a friend of Israel. Well, what about America's relationship with Israel in the past? President Harry Truman was instrumental in gaining statehood for Israel in the 1947-48 period and admission to the United Nations in 1949. And that was really against the flow in many ways. The U.S. helped Israel win three wars. The Sinai Campaign of 1956, the Six-Day War of 1967, and the Yom Kippur War, America's support in 1973 was crucial for the outcome of that conflict. 
Israel relied on US finance in the past, but now Israel does not need the US to prop it up, and the US can no longer afford to do it anyway. And under the current president, Obama, US relations with Israel have sunk to their lowest level in modern history. So there's been a shift. But there is a principle, of course, and we've been talking about this principle over the weekend to some degree. <coughs> history shows that the principle of Genesis 12, verse 3 works in the destiny of nations. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3 is the record of God speaking to Abraham, uh, and he leaves through the four days and then Paran and goes to the land of Canaan. And part of the promise that God makes to him is this. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in these will all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, there are some nations who did bless Israel when it became a nation state. As a result, first of all, of the vote that was taken on the 29th of November 1947, and then, of course, the declaration of the state of Israel on the 14th of May, 1948. So here we have, post-war, we've got Stalin, well, it actually it's not post-war because uh, FDR died on the 12th of April, 1945, and the war didn't end until the 7th of May, 1945. It was pretty close to the end of, of the European war, at least. You've got Stalin, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill the big three, they called them. And Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill met three times during the Second World War and agreed to establish an international peacekeeping organization that would prevent future world wars. Well, <coughs> it's not going to succeed. The United Nations organization uh, in 1947 went about the business of trying to resolve the problems that came from the Second World War. One of those, of course, was the displacement of the Jews and the Holocaust. The fact that no country wanted any Jews in 1947, the UN had 57 member states. In 2014, it's got 192. Just keep that in mind a little bit later on. Well, what happened was that they set up a commission to investigate the partitioning of the land of Palestine into two portions. One would, would be given to the Jews and the other to the Arabs to provide a Jewish homeland. And of course, initially Britain was behind that, but they were opposed to it uh, when it actually happened. And here is Kyan Weisman. We're going to talk a bit more about Kyan Weisman later, appearing before the UN Committee for Palestine. Well, what happened? Well, what happened was that there was a vote taken on the 29th of November 1947. Here in this, uh, this is the old uh, General Assembly. Australia was the first nation to vote yes to the petitioning of the land, and Canada was about four or five after them. Canada, of course, was then and still is a supporter of Israel, as is Australia. So this resolution, 181, was presented by the UN Ad Hoc Committee on Palestine of the UN General Assembly, and it was passed, 33 votes to 13, with 10 abstentions and one absentee. This man, this man played a very big part in all that. Now, he became President of the United States of America in April 1945, on the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had been re-elected in 1944. Okay. And uh, like all vice presidents who become president, they, they start with a handicap, a bit like Gerald Ford, isn't it? He was beaten by Jimmy Carter in 1976. They start with a handicap. Well, they weren't initially elected by the people, so he becomes president without being elected. So he happened to be a friend of Israel. And he got involved, very deeply involved in the discussions that went on. Here he is talking to Abba Eban, who was Israel's representative of the United Nations, and to their first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. And what happened was this. At the United Nations, the Jews announced their plans. Sought political support abroad. America, the top capitalists. The U.S. State Department argued against it. Their first response was no country, no state. Look, when that, did you know? Ben 
Gurion sent his close colleague, Moshe Charette, to convince the Americans to recognize the proposed Jewish state. Charette tried to persuade Secretary of State George Marshall, who was totally opposed to the idea. But President Truman surprised everyone with his strong support. I was told by all these so-called experts that it, it was done. It, it, it involved the whole Near East in a war, and it would also involve the United States. Hitler had been murdering Jews right away. I saw it, and I dream about it even to this day. The Jews needed some place where they could go. It was my attitude that the American government could stand idly by while the victims of at this madness were not allowed to build new lives. Marshall was worried that war would break out. We are in the midst of a very critical situation. We should, therefore, carefully avoid approaching international problems on an emotional basis. He wanted to maintain good relations with the Arabs. Two days before the British left Palestine, Truman summoned Marshall to the White House. Clark Clifford was asked to support the case for a Jewish state. And the Marshall started out. The uh, president listened attentively the and then said, uh, I would like now to hear from Clark. But as I spoke, I saw Marshall's face getting better and better. When I finished, he exploded. Marshall accused Truman of a transparent dodge to win the Jewish vote. Clark Clifford did not disguise the fact that Marshall was a raging man. They don't need a state, they don't deserve a state, it isn't theirs. <clears throat> They've stolen that land. Uh, these were Marshall's words. He turned to the president and said, I am obliged, Mr. President, to tell you that if you should adopt the policy that is recommended by Clifford, I would be unable to vote for you in this coming election in November. Well, dead silence in the No one had ever heard anything. I had never heard anybody threaten the President of the United States in that manner. Before Marshall could go any further, Truman ended the meeting. In November 1948, Truman won the presidential election against the odds. And the newspapers declared the winner as Thomas Dewey. Next morning, President was Harry Truman. I will bless them that bless thee against the odds. That is a testimony to the truth of Genesis 12, verse 3. So, what happened to the world's superpower policeman? From the early 20th century, America grew to become, of course, a prosperous and very dominant power in world affairs and two world wars into which America had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, made it into the world's police eventually. 2014, America is simply a shell of its former self. It's been bruised from foreign adventures, which have cost squillions of dollars in the defense of liberty, bankrupt from poor management at home, and very close to collapse. That's where America is today. So they can't be the world's policemen anymore, like they used to be. And they were initially, anyway, the reluctant ally of the British. I just want to tell you a story about World War I and how America came into the war. In 1915, after about 18 months of war, Britain had lost one million men on the fields of Flanders in France, and they were nearly bankrupt. They were also very short of high explosives. So it looked like the war was over for Britain. Now think about the implications of that. The cabinet was going to go and ask Germany for armistice terms, which would have meant that Germany won the war. That would have meant that the Turks would not have been pushed out of Palestine to create a, a, a 
place for Israel to have a nation state, it would have meant that there would be no Balfour Declaration because that came about because of, of the activities of Kyan Weissman. Would have been a whole range of things in terms of Bible prophecy that would not have happened. Well, of course, that couldn't be allowed to happen, could it? Could not be allowed to happen. So Winston Churchill, who was clearly there by divine uh, intervention, because he should have been dead, he should have been like Swiss cheese. He fought in the Boer War of 1901. He was captured, he escaped, and some of those who escaped, and he was shot to pieces. But he escaped. Why? God had a purpose for this man in two world wars. And so he played his part. And he was pretty ruthless, was Winston Churchill. He had a plan to drag the US into the war. He arranged for high explosives to be loaded aboard the British passenger ship Lusitania in New York Harbor. And they sold passages across the Atlantic, because in those days you couldn't catch a plane across the Atlantic. You had to go on a ship. <coughs> they sold passages across the Atlantic to unsuspecting Americans who were really pawns in the game, as were the other 1,000 or you know, 1,500 passengers. German spies in New York alerted their masters uh, in Germany who then placed ads in New York papers and only two minor papers in New York published those ads. You can actually see copies of the ads that the German government wanted to put in to the papers to warn Americans against buying tickets on the Lusitania because it had now become a ship of war. It was being loaded with high explosives which Britain was short of. Well this was all a ploy. Here it is, this is the Lusitania. It all applauded. It sailed on the 1st of May, 1915. It was given one cruiser to escort it across the Atlantic, and that cruiser was called off, and they came around the tip of Scotland, and the Lusitania received orders to slow down, to make it a sitting duck for the U-boats that Winston Churchill knew were in the area. It was torpedoed by a German U-boat on Friday the 7th of May, 1915, off Ireland was hit by two torpedoes, the high explosives of course erupted and the ship sank very quickly. Now Churchill knew that those U-boats were lurking off the coast of Ireland and the British ship was sunk with 84 by the U-boat that apparently sunk the Lusitania, but he knew they were there. He set this up. 1195 of the 1959 passengers on board drowned, including 128 Americans, one of them a very prominent American. And it was that, the outrage that that caused in America that finally brought America into the war in early 1917, tipped the balance in the First World War, and so Britain won the war. And so Bible prophecy was fulfilled. In the meantime, Kyan Weizmann, a Jew, working in a laboratory in Manchester, invented synthetic cordite, which saved Britain in terms of high explosives. All right? And for that, he was given the Balfour Declaration. James Arthur Balfour, in the cabinet, signed the letter on the 2nd of November 1917 to guarantee that the British government would seek a homeland for the Jews. And by 1921-22, the British had been given a mandate over Palestine. Now, there you've got it. America was dragged, kicking and screaming into the First World War, and it was true, of course, of the Second World War. Now, when President Obama came to office in January 2009 after his election, one of the first things he did when he walked into the Oval Office was to, was to throw out the bust of Winston Churchill. Now, this bust of Winston Churchill was lent to the American government after the events of 11th September 2001, when the towers came down in New York and Britain gave this from one of their museums, they gave this bus to George Bush Jr. as a sign of British support for the Americans. When Obama came out, the very first thing he did was to get rid of that. They sent it back to Brisbane, to Britain. And then later he declared that France was America's closest ally, not Britain. All right? Well, what about America's reluctance in World War II? During the Depression years, a strong anti-war movement prevented the US from entering that war in 1939. And that, that movement was led by Charles Lindbergh, who in 1928 crossed the Atlantic 
in a little single monoplane. Alright? Landed in France. Well, of course, he became famous. He became very rich. Didn't help him much because his son was kidnapped and killed. And so he set about keeping America out of everybody else's affairs. And he did a great job because America refused to come in to the, to the, to the Second World War. And if any politician had said that he was going to do that, he would have been out of office. So he couldn't do it. But of course, God wanted America in the Second World War. America was happy to supply arms, of course, to Britain under the Lend Lease deal, which Britain took about 30 or 40 years to pay off, but refused to become involved with their military. It was only when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941, that FDR stood up in the Congress and said, we're going to war. He declared war on both Japan and Germany. That's how they got dragged into the Second World War. They were extremely reluctant. God's purpose required both interventions for reasons fulfilling Bible prophecy. But let's not mistake America's role in those two wars. They were not willing participants in support of the British. The young lions of Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 13 Shebra and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, but all the young lions thereof does not include America. They do not have a British form of government. Their form of government is French. In fact, most things about America are French, if you look carefully enough. Just look up your GPS on Lafayette Street in America. You know when you go to the White House, anybody been to the White House here? You go to the White House and you stand looking out across the park, over the road, it's Lafayette Park. In the right hand corner of that park there is a huge bronze, bronze statue to Colonel Lafayette. He was sent by the French government in the 1780s to support the Americans against the British. And it was French support that won the War of Independence in America in 1782. The Battle of Yorktown was the last major conflict the Battle of Yorktown, the British commander was, Gen was General Cornwallis. But he couldn't get resupply. He was there on the James River at Yorktown, and the French flocked the British ships, coming to supply him the troops and the weapons. Coming from New York, they blocked the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, and the French then landed their own troops, in addition to those who were already fighting alongside the Americans, and that was the end of it. Cornwallis had to capitulate. So he surrendered. That was the end of the War of Independence, and it was all over. When the Americans put together their governmental system, it was based on the French model, presidential model, not the British model, like Canada and Australia, and India has. Okay? And moreover, when they designed Washington, D.C., the capital, guess who the architect was? A Frenchman. When they put together their first government, you know who George Washington appointed as the finance minister? The most important job in the government? Yeah, Frenchman. I've got a photograph of this, of this uh, statue outside of the original finance building. America is more French. That's why they got liberty on their coin. That's why the Statue of Liberty is there. It was given to them as a gift by the French government. Alright? They're more French than they are British. They might speak the English language with uh, some, uh, you know, difficulty. <laughs> but they're not a young lion. So who are the young lions? Well, here's the First World War poster. The Empire, the British Empire, needs men. Helped by the young lions, the old lion defies his foe. So who are they? <coughs> Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand. All of whom have a British form of government. And three of them had the Queen as their titular head of state. All right. Have you got the Queen on your coin? Yes, so have we. So it's New Zealand. All right. So they're the young minds, and they're the ones who will fulfill Ezekiel 38, verse 13. So where does America fit into the unfolding purpose of God in the latter days? Well, that's why we read Luke 21. I want you to come to Luke 21. Luke 21 
from verse 24 is a passage of scripture that is very important to us, is it not? Because we saw a fulfillment of Bible prophecy in June 1967, when in the Six Day War, a war that is still spoken of with awe, when military things are being considered, that Six Day War saw the freeing of Jerusalem from the hand of foreign powers, the end of the treading down of Jerusalem by foreign armies. It's never again going to be trodden down. The guarantee of that is Zechariah 14, verse 2. Oh yes, a portion of the city will be trodden down, the modern city of Jerusalem, but not the old city. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, but the other half shall not be cut off. And the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints will arrive before the old city falls. It's not going to be trodden down again. It's had its last treading down. So here we are. We've seen this prophecy fulfilled. Jerusalem would be trodden down, and by the way, the name Jebus means trodden down. And it was called Jebus when David took it. Right? It should be no longer trodden down, because there will, be, will come a time called until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So we saw Bible prophecy been fulfilled in 1967. So what's the next verse in Luke 21 about? Verse 25. What's well, about 1968? That's what it's about. Then there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them for fear. Well, what are these symbols here? Well, sun, moon, and stars, we know as uh, familiar Bible students, we know that these are the symbols of powers. The sun is a symbol of political powers and governments in scripture. The moon is a symbol for ecclesiastical systems in scriptures that derives its light from the sun, like state religions, state supported religions do. And stars, of course, we don't have any problem with it. The world's full of superstars, film stars, sports stars, all kinds of stars. We don't have any problem with that language, do we? We know it talks about prominent important people. There will be signs in the political governments, ecclesiastical systems and amongst prominent people. And this will produce a condition upon earth called distress. Distress of nations with perplexity. And perplexity is the Greek word aporia. It means at a loss for a way to proceed. Having no resources, not knowing how to handle the problems that are confronting you. Yes. And then it says the powers of the heavens should be shaken. Men's hearts would be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven, that's the sun and the moon and the stars, they would be shaken. It's talking about the shaking of world governments, national governments all around the globe. When did that start? When did that start? Well, let, let men, let the world tell us when that started. It started in 1968, you've got to see the moment. The sea. The sea, of course, is a symbol in the Bible for nations. You know that from Isaiah 17, 12 to 13, and 57, 20. Listen to what the Time magazine said on the 11th of January, 1988. It's the 20th anniversary of 1968. Like a knife blade, the year set a past from future. Now, this is, this is not Christadelphians talk. This is the Time magazine. Do you reckon these people knew anything about the Bible? No, probably not. But this is their language. The spasms of unrest seemed almost psychologically coordinated with a mysterious common impulse that swept through the nervous system of a global generation. 1968 had the vibrations of earthquake about it. America shuddered. History cracked open. The year was pivotal and messy. It produced vivid theatre. It reverberates still in the American mind, because America was probably the most affected nation in relation to what Christ said. I was going to say this, 1968 was tragedy and horrific entertainment. Deaths of heroes, uprisings, suppressions, the end of dreams, blood on the streets of Chicago at the Democratic Convention, and Paris and Saigon, and at Christmas time, almost ludicrously, man floating around the moon. Now in 2008, which is the 40th anniversary of 1968, the BBC had a three-part series 
on Radio 4. And you can look it up, you can go on the internet, you can look it up. Three part radio series by the BBC on the importance of 1968. Now, when I went to the Southern White House, that was the home of Lyndon B. Johnson, which is in Texas, of course, now set up as a museum to celebrate uh, Johnson's rule as president uh, from 1963 to 1968. You can go in there and buy a DVD on 1968. I got one. Showing you the importance of that year. Well, did they produce all of that based on their understanding of Luke 21 25? Don't think so. But we know, we know what Cross was saying, because we know that verse 24 is about 1967, and then he says, this is what they're going to see immediately after. 1968. Now, the time cover under this heading had, after 20 years, the apocalyptic events. Did I read that correctly? Apocalyptic? That's a biblical word. <coughs> of 1968 are still reverberating. And at the heading and end of Heroes, it said this, the year had many legacies, but the assassinations were among the most important and were the hardest to bear. They all were history and broke something essential in the national morale. They broke hope. The best leaders of our time were dead, Tom Hayden says now. They had been murdered. That is the heart of the tragedy. By 1968, I knew I was part of an apocalypse, which is different from the earlier ideas. You feel you are carried by events that are out of your control. That's exactly what Christ says in that verse. Distress of nations with perplexity. No way forward. Events outside your control. That's what 1968 produced. We were looking. 1968, fulfilling Bible prophecy. And this is what it looked like. Stars falling from heaven. Martin Luther King assassinated. Robert Kennedy assassinated in California at the end of a primary vote by Sahan Sahan. Shot behind the ear with a pistol. He would have won the, the presidency. Yeah, the star falling from heaven. In Paris, student riots. In Mexico, tanks trying to suppress student rights. Russian tanks in Prague trying to suppress independence of that country. All right? And this is what Paris looked like. It wasn't the place to go in 1968. All right? Got a feel for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in Luke 21-25? doesn't stop there. He spake of them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own souls that summer is now nigh at hand. Well, fig tree, the biblical symbol for Israel. can be proven, of course, by going to a number of passages. But he doesn't just say, Behold the fig tree, Israel, which emerged, of course, in 1948. He says, And all the trees. So what's happened since Israel became a nation state? Well, we know that trees are used in the Bible as a symbol for nations, as Ezekiel 31. And when Israel became a nation in 1948, there were 57 nations in the United Nations, and there are now 192. There has been explosion of trees. But behold the fig tree Israel, but don't just behold it. Behold all the trees. There would be an explosion of nations on earth. And it's happened. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. So where are we in the scheme of things? Well, let's just step back to the fig tree. 1948, Israel becomes a nation state. It was followed by what they call the mad era. Mutual assured destruction through nuclear weapons. And men's hearts began to fail them for fear. 1967 was another milestone, the Six Day War, fulfilling Luke 21 24. And 1968 began the era of perplexity. When men's hearts would fail them for fear because they could see no way forward. 
1973 Yom Kippur War produced the 1974 fuel crisis when the Arabs, of course, closed off the fuel coming out of the Middle East. In 1987 there was a stock market crash which sent shivers through nations. And in 1991 there was a Gulf War accompanied by a recession. And then there was the events of 2001, the bringing down of the Twin Towers. And then, of course, the world began to feel the effects of global warming and other erratic climatic changes, which may, in fact, be partly delivered by angelic intervention, not just what man has created. Because it says in Luke 21, there should be great signs from heaven. And the preposition that's used there has to do with origin. The origin is from heaven, not just the dealings of man. And then, of course, in 2008, there was a global financial crisis which created the conditions that will lead to the Great Depression that will make the Depression in the 1930s look like a Sunday school picnic. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming, but he won't be alone, in a cloud, the symbol of a multitude, power and great glory, and have his saints with him. He will have come to collect them first. So what's the message for us? When these things begin, that's the operative word, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Now that word there, see then look up in Luke 21, that word is the Greek word anakupto. It doesn't mean to look up. It means to raise oneself up being elated. It's like someone who expects someone to knock on the door and so they're up out of their seat, go to the door before they hear the knock because they know that person's coming. They hear the indications that that person's arrived. Christ is coming. We need to be up at the door. You know why it's important? Because he says this. He goes on to say this in verse 35. By the way, verse 34 confirms what we said about Luke 17. See verse 34? Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. What does that sound like to you? Soup kitchen cues? Does it? No. It sounds like prosperity to me. And then he says this in verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now that word dwell is used 89 times in the New Testament. It is never rendered in the King James Version dwell anywhere else. 88 of the 89 occurrences are rendered sit or sat. So why not render it here? Sit. Because that would be very fitting, wouldn't it? Because you see that the exhortation is go to the door, lift up yourself. You wonder about that word it's used twice in John chapter 8 when Christ crouched down and then it says he lifted himself up. That's what that word means. But we're living in a sitting world, aren't we? They sit in sports grounds. They sit in theatres. They sit in restaurants. They sit in hotels. They sit in front of televisions. They're couch potatoes. It's a sitting generation. Isn't it? <coughs> what does Christ say about us? Verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand. That's different than sitting, isn't it? To stand before the Son of Man. The word stand here means to hold your place. So there's a warning given. Prosperity, pleasure, all the stuff that fills our lives, which most of it requires you to sit, might get in the way. Because that's what the world's doing. So let's take that warning to ourselves. Lift up our heads, because there's no question our attention is drawing on.